Hi everyone, I'm Apero. Welcome to my channel. I'm a member of Team Aratusa, and today I will be running you through a harmony deck, a Mystic Echo harmony deck, and I'll be showing you some examples of how to play this deck with the help of the lovely Seely, who I co-opted with earlier. Now, Mystic Echo Harmony has turned into a bit of a mainstay of Scoia'tael, and so I'm going to run you through the cards that we include in this deck, what we're kind of trying to do with each of them, and then we'll use an example game at the end of the video to show you how to play it in context. Now, this video is aimed at beginners, so there will be a lot of explanations of basic mechanics, and uh, if you're looking for something a bit more high level, you might not find this particularly satisfying. If, however, you are looking for a Scoia'tael deck that will be something solid, something that will stick around, and something that you really want to get to know, but which is easy to pilot and easy to learn, then this is the guide for you. And I hope that you'll hit the subscribe button and leave a comment to let me know what you think. We're just going to run through the deck quickly in the deck builder so you can see which cards we've included here. I will also be including a link below so that you can import this into your deck builder directly. So let's actually begin with the bronze cards. Now we're going to start at the bottom here and we're going to start with the Dolblathana Bowman. Uh, now it's not too complex, uh, simply put, when you play these units, you damage an enemy unit by one for each row that separates it from this unit. So uh, if we acknowledge that the front row of our two rows is the melee row and the farther away row or the bottom row on our side is the ranged row, then if you are playing this unit on the melee row and you are hitting a unit on the opponent's melee row, then they are only one row apart and you will damage that unit by one. So the minimum damage you can essentially do in this situation is one. The maximum is three if you are on the ranged row and your opponent's unit was on the ranged row too. Vryhead Officer has two different abilities depending on which row you play him in. So if you play him in the melee row, you damage the enemy unit by two. If you play him in a ranged row, you boost an allied unit by two. So obviously this is a reactive card. We have two types of cards, reactive and proactive. Proactive card simply means you can play it on the board when there are no other cards to interact with. And a reactive unit is something that requires other cards on the board. Um, both of these cards, the Vryhead Officer and the Dolblathana Bowman, uh, require other units on the board and they are therefore reactive. Uh, what we can see above is a proactive card, that is the Miner. Now, it does have an order, so it does require another unit to be on the board eventually, but since orders do take one turn to trigger, you can play this card when there are no other cards on the board. So that's why we call it a proactive unit. So the Miner is very simple, straightforward. Uh, on order, that is after one turn, you can boost an allied unit by two. If the, the unit you want to boost is a dwarf, it also provides it with two armor. So that can assist things like your defender, for example, and just giving it a little more um, protection, I suppose you would say, from other effects. Now we move on to another proactive play, and that is the Marker Marauder. The Marker Marauder also has a bonded ability. That is, if you have two of them in your hand, the first one you play will have the normal deploy effect, which is to gain vitality for two turns. But the second one you play will have this bonded ability, and bonded is triggered if there is another unit of the same, well, another copy of that unit on the board under your control. So if you play one Marker Marauder and it survives, then when you play the second Marker Marauder, it will gain vitality for four turns instead of two. So we really want to make sure that we take advantage of that, and those two together can be quite a nice combination, especially for round one. Now Dryad's Caress plays a bit of an interesting role in this deck. It is a nature card, which becomes very important because it can combine with four, as we'll see later and it allows us to purify an allied unit and boost it by three. If you control a Dryad, it also gives it vitality for three turns. So potentially, Dryad's Caress can give you six points over three turns plus a purify. However, most of the time we want to mulligan this card. The majority of the time it's a little bit underpowered and we just want to keep it in our deck as a bit of a backup in case Forv doesn't have access to other nature cards. So it's a very important inclusion in this deck. However, most of the time you will be mulliganing it. If you know that the deck you're playing against has a lot of poison effects or bleeding effects, it might be worth holding onto it in that scenario. 
Now we come to the trained hawk. Now, what's really interesting about the trained hawk is that it is the first card in this deck that uses the harmony keyword. So I'm going to click into it so we can have a little uh, look at it in a bit more detail. Um, so harmony essentially allows you to trigger a boost effect whenever you play a square tail unit on your side whose primary category is unique among all of your units. Now, this can be a little bit tricky to get your head around at first, so I want to explain it in a slightly different way. So if you have played your Hawk, you've played your Hawk and it's sitting on there, it's worth three points. Yeah, we can see the power of there, three points when you first play it. And then let's say you play Dryad Ranger. Now, Dryad Ranger, it has the Dryad tag. Now, if you've only played your Hawk, Where's, where's our little hawk gone? There you are, hockey. So if you play your hawk, you have a beast tag, right? So you have one beast on the board, but you do not have a dryad. So you play your dryad ranger. It's the first card of that category that you have on your side of the board. The hawk will boost itself to four points. Okay, so it will boost up by one point and become four. This is really important that you understand this concept because harmony is the main way that you will be generating points in this deck. It is important you get your head around it. So if you have played the Hawk and you have the harmony key, keyword, sorry, and then you play Muralega. No. <laughs> now Muralega is also a beast. You will not boost the Hawk because the Hawk is also a beast. You already have a Scoia'tael unit on your side of the board, under your control, with the beast tag, you are not going to trigger that ability, or that boost, I should say. So primary category is what they are referring to there when they're talking about this keyword or this category. Um, and it's saying unique among all of your units, but when it says all of your units, it's actually only referring to the units under your control on your side of the board. It is not referring to any of the cards in your hand. It is not referring to the cards in your deck. It is only cards under your control. Now, this also means that if your opponent destroys a unit with a certain primary category, well, now that primary category is not on your side of the board and playing a new card of that category will trigger the harmony effect. You'll see how this works in the example game that I post, but it's really important for you to understand this concept. Okay, so harmony boosts a unit by one, or as we'll see later, in some cases by two, depending on whether or not you already have a card of that category on the board, on your side, under your control and alive. Okay, so I hope that that's clear. Um, if not, please do watch the example game that comes. I think that will clarify everything. And if that's still not clear, please do feel free to comment below and I will try my best to clarify it even further. The next card we have is the Dwarven Chariot. The Dwarven Chariot will spawn a rowdy dwarf in the row. Um, we do not have two Dwarven Chariots in our deck, so you don't need to worry about the bonded ability. However, if we did have two, Dwarven Chariots in our deck, then it would potentially spawn two Rowdy Dwarfs if it were the second Chariot played. The other benefit to the Chariot is that it does have the Machine tag, which means it is a different category, a different primary category for our Harmony cards. One downside to the Chariot uh, that is important to understand is that it spawns a Rowdy Dwarf, which means that there will be a Dwarf on the board. So if you have Harmony units, as I said, they are only procced if you don't already control a card of that category. So if you play the Dwarven Chariot and it spawns a Rowdy Dwarf, you now have a Dwarf on your side of the board and playing another Dwarf will not trigger the Harmony. So you will get one trigger for the fact that this is a machine on the Harmony, but you will not get the trigger for the Dwarf and no other Dwarfs will trigger Harmony. So it, therefore, if you're playing with a lot of Harmony cards on the board, or if the Harmony points are really important to you in this particular round, then it can be worth considering playing the Chariot after you play another Dwarf, for example, um, one of our Marker Marauders or a Miner. Now we have the Dryad Rangers, who I mentioned earlier. They are also a Harmony card. They also trigger, oh, uh, they also are boosted by one point for each new primary category card from Scoia'tael that you play. Um, you damage an enemy unit by one and then you poison it. As you might expect, we have two of these. Uh, the poison effect 
is a status that is applied to a card, uh, that, sorry, that is applied to a unit, uh, and only once it has been applied twice will that unit be destroyed. Now, generally speaking, if you're playing against decks that tend to run tall units, and that really counts for things like Syndicate at the moment, uh, often monsters as well, then you want to save your poison ideally until later in the game or until you see a card that you know is high value. Most of the time it's worth holding on to your poison effects until later in the game. If you are, however, playing against uh, most square tail decks or most Northern Realms decks, they go what we call broad, which is that they're playing lots of units for lower value, uh, then the poison effect probably won't get as much value for you, and it can be worth using your poison cards earlier in the game in that situation. So this does require a little bit of knowledge about what the opponent is likely to be playing. I would say don't throw it away too early, really try to consider what card is your opponent likely to be playing that could get you some good value on a poison potentially later in the game. Vryhead Sapper is our next card. It is a Purify card. Uh, if you're not sure what I mean by Purify, I can highly recommend my video, which is about Lock versus Purify. I will link to it uh, somewhere, I don't know, down there, <laughs> so that you can see the difference between the two. It is really important to understand the difference between Lock and Purify in terms of how you can use it both on your side of the board and on your opponents. Uh, so the Vryhead Sapper does allow you to purify an allied unit. It will only allow you to purify an opponent's unit if you have an elf on your side of the board under your control. So this if you control phrase means that you have a unit on your side of the board that is not dead, essentially. So those are our bronze cards. Let's move on to the gold cards and we're going to start with Percival. Now Percival is a gnome. We only run two gnomes. So that's very good for our harmony. Prox and Percival himself has harmony two. So when you see harmony two, that means that for every card played that is a new category on your side of the board, which is a square tail card, you actually get to boost Percival by two points rather than by one point. So he's very useful and really worth playing early in a round if you want to get the most value out of him. Weeping Willow is another poison card. It plays for five points. It does have a secondary uh, ability, which is to play on the melee row, and it can gain a shield. So if you'd rather protect it, let's say you don't have any of your Dryad Rangers, and you need to play this card, and you want more Harmony cards on the board, because Weeping Willow, of course, also has the Harmony keyword, then you can play it on the melee row, get a little bit of extra protection with shield. Um, to promote myself yet again, I do have a video about shield. If you're unsure what a shield does, uh, it's very important that you understand that and you can watch that. I guess I'll link it there as well. Um, and that is about the difference between shield and armor and you can see it that way. But the, the short version is that the shield will protect you against damage for one hit. So people can't just kill your willow with uh, an Alzur's Thunder, for example. It will hit the shield and that will take the damage for you. Next we have Forv. Now Forv is a dryad that plays a nature card from your deck. There's a term for this, this is called tutoring. So this is a tutor card. Tutoring a card basically just means you can find a certain card in your deck. So Forv allows you to tutor out a nature card. We run three nature cards, um, one of which is basically the key card, and we will get to that, which is Water of Broccolon. That is accessible via Forv. Call of the Forest allows you to play a Squirtel unit from your deck. Now, all of our units are Squirtel units, so it essentially allows you to pull any unit from your deck and boost it by one. And of course, our backup nature card is Dryad's Caress. So you should almost always have a target for four of a nature card that you can play. Um, it is important if you're in round three and you're looking at your mulligans, if you only have one nature card in your deck, you might not want to do your last mulligan just to make sure that you don't accidentally brick for. Now, bricking is what we term it when a tutor card does not have anything to tutor. So if you have Call of the Forest, Water of Broccolon, and Dryad's Caress in your hand with Forf, Forf has nothing in your deck to pull out, and Forf ends up being worth two points.
not ideal. So it's just something to be careful of when playing this deck as a beginner. It can be very easy to overlook or forget that you must have a nature card in your deck. So it is worth checking during that mulligan phase. Next, we have the kind of combo of Etrail and Muliga. Now, these two go together like, I don't know, chocolate and strawberries. <laughs> Now, Etriel is an elf that can damage an enemy unit by three, and if you control Mulega, you damage a unit by seven instead. On the flip side, Mulega damages an enemy unit by three, and if you control Etriel, it damages adjacent units by three also. Let's unpack this a little bit. Both of these cards do three damage when you drop it, if you don't have the other one on the board. If you have both of these in your hand and you want to play them, you have to decide what is most valuable to you or what will hurt your opponent more. Will it be damaging one unit by seven or, in the case of Mulega, damaging three units by three? So when it says damaging adjacent unit, what, units, what that means is that three units right next to each other will all receive three damage. That might be much more valuable to you. You might be able to wipe out um, Azar Javed, for example, and his Scarabs in one turn with Mulega. That could be something that is incredibly valuable to you. Alternatively, you might have an engine that your opponent has played. So that is an engine something that's generating points per turn. So let's say it's gaining one point per turn and it's on six points. You can play Mulega and then play Etriel and kill that unit with your seven points of damage. So you kind of have to know which one is more valuable to you. Obviously, the three by three is worth more points, worth nine points instead of seven. So if you have a choice between them and all other things considered equal, that would probably be your best bet to play Etriel first and then play Muliga second. However, as I said, it does depend on what your opponent is playing and you have to use your judgment to decide which one will provide the most benefit to you and which will damage them the most. Now we have one of the Gwent community's favorite cards, which is Pavko Gale. Uh, Pavko Gale is very close to our hearts because you may or may not know that the artwork is actually of our beloved Berger, the community manager for CDPR. He's the community manager for Gwent for CDPR, uh, and he also voices the card lines. He is, of course, human. Um, he is not an elf, but he works for Scoia'tael, I guess, or he works with Scoia'tael. And he has a great ability. So you play him on the ranged row. So what that means is that if you play him on the melee row, he will be worth only five points. So you must play him on the ranged row to get value out of him beyond five points. Every turn, you can damage a unit by one point. So we can say cooldown one is just another way of saying every turn as long as you do this order. So if you have him on the board and you forget to damage a unit by one that turn, tough luck, you don't get two turns the next go around. You only ever get one point per turn, so it's worth going for it every time. Now, it is worth mentioning that if you control only Squirtel units, you damage a unit by two instead. And that happens to be what our deck is. It is made up of exclusively Squirtel units. Most of the time, therefore, Pavko will be giving two points of damage per turn, as long as you remember to use him and as long as you play him on the ranged row. The downside is that if you are playing against an enemy such as Nilfgaard, they will be able to play spy units, and that will put a Nilfgaard unit under your control, and suddenly you'll only be hitting for one again. So that is something to watch out for, but most of the time you will be getting two points per turn with Pavko, and as a result, it can really be worth uh, playing him in combination with our defender, who happens to be right here. Often what we will want to do is to play Figus Meluzzo on the ranged row and then play Pavko behind him. If we're in a long round three, um, you'll probably be playing your waters on the ranged row, then you'll be playing your figures, and then you'll be playing your Pavko, and all of your expensive or your valuable units will be on the ranged row altogether. Now this can be a bit dangerous of course, um, but at the same time that is usually the best way to protect them. So that's a nice little combination that you have available to you and uh, Pavko continues to be a very valuable Scoia'tael card and very close to all of our hearts. I mentioned earlier that we have two gnomes in this deck and here we come across our second one. Here is Barnabas Beckenbauer. 
And uh, Barnabas is a gnome who boosts an allied elf, dwarf, and dryad unit by two. Now, to make that absolutely clear, you get to apply six points worth of boosts. You apply two points to three different units, and you select which ones they are. So you get to choose an elf, choose a dwarf, choose a dryad to receive two points each. Um, it is not randomly assigned. Uh, if you don't have an elf... I actually did not know that was possible to happen while I was recording videos, but there you go. Someone's followed me. Thank you. Um, so if you don't have an elf, for example, you will just boost a dwarf and a dryad by two. So you'll get four points worth of value in addition to a six point body. Um, and of course, if you only have an elf and you don't have a dwarf and a dryad, then you only get two points. So you can only boost what's there, essentially. But assuming you have an Elf, a Dwarf, and a Dryad, you can boost one of each by two points. So he can be worth a lot of points. And in addition to that, because he's a gnome and we don't have a lot of gnomes, you could also be triggering the harmony effect of your other cards. And that can make him worth a lot of points. So he's he can be very valuable to us. Now, I mentioned earlier Call of the Forest. I'll just quickly run over its ability again. It's another tutoring card, much like Forv, except it allows us to access any Scoia'tael unit from our deck and boost it by one. So we could access, let's say, Figures if we need a Defender, and he will uh, start not at five points, but at six instead, just as an example. Very often you'll be using Call of the Forest to access some of your high value cards towards the end of the round or at the end of a game, depending on when you need it most. I'm going to quickly skip over Water of Broccolon and go straight to the Great Oak. Now the Great Oak is basically designed to be a finisher for this deck, and for most Scoia'tael decks you will see Great Oak make an appearance because it is just such high value and so worthwhile and very flexible. So you can play Great Oak on either row. It has the Trant tag. Uh, we do not have a lot of cards with that tag. The only other one is, where have you gone? Weeping Willow. Yes, yeah, so again, it also helps with our Harmony procs. Um, the Great Oak will be played on a row ideally with a lot of units. It will damage an opposing unit by the number of units that are to its left. So if you have a row with five units on it and you play the Great Oak on the far right of those units, you can damage another unit by five points. So it's one point of damage per card to the left. Alternatively, you can just boost the Oak by the number of units, sorry, by the number of cards on its right. Uh, so that is, really flexible. That means that if your opponent doesn't have a good target for damage, you can use it to boost yourself. Most of the time, I would recommend using it to incur damage rather than to boost yourself. Ideally, where you can, you'd like to avoid creating uh, tall units, that is high power units uh, on your side of the board, if you can do damage to your opponent, because high power units can be destroyed, but damage to your opponent is forever. So now we come to the bread and butter of this deck, which is the Water of Broccolon. Now, this deck for a long time has been built around this card. The Water of Broccolon is a 12 provision special card. It is a nature card, so we can access it with fourth, and it spawns two Dryad Fledglings into the row. Now, the Dryad Fledgling, as you can see here, is worth four points each and it has a harmony tag. So straight away, if you're playing the Dryad Fledglings and then let's say a beast, they will boost to five points each and you've just gotten an extra two points for playing that card. What we want to do is to actually play the Water of Broccolon and then play our leader ability, Mystic Echo, which allows us to play a Scoia'tael special card from our graveyard. So you play Water of Broccolon, that is then in your graveyard. You can then, on your next turn, play something like Figus, and then play Mystic Echo to bring out another two Dryad Fledglings. And suddenly, you've got four points per turn for every card of a new category that you play. Because of that Harmony proc, because every time you play a card with a new category, it is being boosted. So there's an extra four points per turn. It is incredibly satisfying and it is just uh, really, as I said, the bread and butter of this deck. It is what this deck aims to do, generate points 
to an uh, unoppressible level uh, via the harmony ability. Uh, if you can, you would like to do this twice uh, using the leader ability in round three. It is not always possible. Sometimes you need to commit water of Brocolon in round two in order to stay alive if someone's bleeding you. But most of the time you will be trying to hold on to it into round three. As a reminder, you can access it via four. So if you have four in your hand and you don't have water of Brocolon, hold on to four until round three so you can do this trick, so to speak, uh, and then use Mystic Echo that way. Just a quick note about the end shade Sabre. We'll mostly be using this right before we get out of round one, just to give ourselves a bit of an extra point boost uh, before we exit. A lot of the time we don't care if we win round one, we have a great long round. Our general strategy is to have a nice long round three. Ideally for us, we use round one to get rid of some of our bronze cards. Um, the opponent either gives us round two or unsuccessfully bleeds us round two and then we go into a long round three. That is ideal. It won't always go that way but what I'm saying is that the end shade saber is really there just to give us a bit of an extra boost alternatively to give us a few extra harmony procs before we get out of round one. Okay, so those are the basics of the deck and what each card does. We're now going to jump into a game that I played. Okay, so those are the basics of the deck and what each card does. I've given you an outline of our general strategy and when we tend to play most cards. And now you'll get to see a game where we did this uh, in combination with the lovely Seely, another team Aritu is a member and pro player who is uh, given us her time in this oh, god damn it okay so now we've run through what every card does our general deck strategy and what we're trying to achieve yeah drop harmony cards get harmony procs go for that nice long round three with a double water of broccolon ideally with our defender and uh i guess profit so now we're going to see how this works in an actual game, which I did in cooperation with the lovely Celia, another member of Team Aratusa and a pro rank player. Uh, she is an excellent player of this deck and she helped me understand the deck better in a special co-op. So I hope that you find this useful and our conversation provides you with some insight. I did play two other games with Celie that ended because we had a forfeit and a disconnection. Uh, if there is any interest in me posting those, I can post those as well. So please do leave uh, notes in comments if that's something that would be of interest to you to see the deck played a little bit more. If not, then I hope you enjoyed what we have here. Just a reminder, please do hit subscribe and I am open to any and all comments in particular about the content of my videos and not about my haircut. I am not sick. I just cut my hair off. It's not a big deal. <laughs> and I will see you around. I'm very active on Twitter, so feel free to follow me there. Um, and I very rarely stream, but if you really want to, you can follow me on Twitch as well. Thanks so much. And I appreciate you spending your time here on my channel. Bye.